Mini episode 916 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You'll want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Welcome to mini episode 916 of the FDH Lounge. I'm FDH managing partner Rick Morris here today with part five of our history of guiding light, America's longest running soap opera. In our estimation, there were five eras of the program in the final quarter century of the show that is the part remembered by most fans, and those are parts two through six of our series following the preface, which is part one. Part seven is our list of the greatest characters of the modern era. For me personally, Guiding Light was a show that I grew to love, having been exposed to it by my mother. At least during its best times, it rose above the typical soap schlock that so often defines the genre, painting interesting and realistic stories about how characters related to one another. Thankfully, there's such a great amount of old episodes and of segments formatted into playlists on the internet, so this series is intended as our guide of what to expect as you navigate each era, as well as food for thought for those who are fans. We've already covered a lot of great storylines, both in the first modern era in the 1980s, the one built around Roger in the early 1990s, and the one scattered throughout overly dramatic Gaga in the mid to late 90s and early 2000s. And the final act in 2009 featured many great developments, more hits than misses, but realistically tying up matters in satisfactory knots is easier than maintaining quality over a period of time, and you'd have to think that the great ending could have occurred on almost any timeline. With all of that being said, it's worth wondering whether this program, rumored for cancellation as far back as the mid-90s, should have gone off the air in 2003, if not earlier, rather than 2009. There's an outstanding case to be made that it would have been a mercy killing in light of all of the crap that circulated during what we're calling the -the off-the-rails era. Simply because of the rich tapestry of guiding light, no creative team can eradicate all quality from the show, no matter how hard they try, so there were some developments that were positive during this time, but they were vastly outnumbered by the pieces of garbage that passed for creative during this period of time. At almost any other juncture, the ridiculous revolving door at the head of Spalding Enterprises that came to include Harley, most recently before that a policewoman, and Dinah, a murderer who had spent several years on the run after her crime, would stick out like a sore thumb, but here it's barely worth mentioning. It is worth noting in all fairness that the returning Dinah, working a redemption storyline after her return to town, was not nearly the one-note brat that she'd evolved into in the 1990s, But while her character was far better developed, like everyone else, the writing for her was generally the pits. It's hard to pinpoint the worst aspects of this era, but let's start chronologically in the fall of 2003 with the Marianne Carruthers storyline. In a complete rip-off of an angle that the show used in the early 1980s, many of the most prominent male characters were implicated in the long-ago death of a young woman. The original plot rewrote history in terms of characters, but this one put the first one to shame, linking Ed Bauer, Alan Spaulding, Josh Lewis, Billy Lewis, and Buzz Cooper as co-conspirators in 1977 when, according to show canon, Ed and Alan were the only ones who knew each other at the time, and the official record of 1977 left open no possibility for even them to have been associated in such a way. Mix in a kidnap scenario with a hall of mirrors down at the old fairgrounds, a heretofore undiscovered secret maze of tunnels beneath Springfield, psychic visions from Riva, and more hokey crap than you could shake a stick at, and this is potentially the most laughable storyline in show history. It was so bad that Peter Simon, who portrayed Ed Bauer from the 1980s forward, left the show and refused to return until the very end. That might have been the worst storyline, but it's hard to pinpoint the most offensive storyline in Guiding Light history. Most of the major candidates came from this era. Maybe it was Ben Reed, returning to the show as a secretly troubled young adult, after having been a fun-loving child for many years, engaging in a sordid serial-killing spree before his death. Maybe it was Alan Michael Spaulding returning to the show to seduce young Marina Cooper, who he had once thought was his daughter when he was married to her mother and had even changed her diapers as an infant. 
Speaking of which, maybe it was Blake hitting on Coop after previously knowing him as a baby also. Maybe it was good guy Josh leaving Riva during an estrangement when she was secretly ill and engaging in a torrid affair with her beloved sister Cassie. Maybe it was Alan Spaulding committing one despicable act after another, leading to impregnating and marrying his former daughter-in-law Beth in a complete bastardization of all the storylines that they'd shared previously. Maybe it was the round of budget cuts that led to the death of Ross Marler in a soul-crushing manner similar to what was done to Marine Bauer years ago, or the subsequent budget cuts that led to Gus being killed off, and a grief-stricken Harley moving away rather than simply making the fans happy, reuniting this beloved couple and sending them off together. Maybe it was Reva's long-lost son Jonathan coming onto the canvas under another identity so that he could seduce his virginal first cousin Tammy as revenge on the family. That last one, though, was redeemed, if you can get past the first cousin thing, which granted not everyone can, by emotional storytelling by all involved, and by their subsequent relationship, one that evoked a sort of modern-day Roger and Holly vibe. Of course, the writers split them up when Lizzie Spaulding got pregnant by Jonathan, intending to pass the baby off as Coop Bradshaw's before the truth was discovered. Alan's hitman tried to kill Jonathan but took out Tammy instead, adding one more Lincoln log to the vast pile of downers during an era that seemed to be trying to alienate its longtime fans. Even when the show tried to do something daring that might have had a chance to end well, they botched the execution. For several years, the show glossed over the fate of Roger after he left for California in 1998, not least of which out of shame for the way that the program treated the great actor Michael Zaslow during his final days of suffering from ALS. In 2004, another long-lost son of his, Sebastian Hulse, emerged with news of his death, and he engaged in a flirtation of Holly that ended through diabolical scheming on his part, leaving this plot as little more than a tired cosplay of the old Holly and Roger dynamic. Speaking of Roger, contrary to how well he was always written, the rule of thumb for this era seemed to be that the more prominent your character was, the more likely you were to be enmeshed in a pile of creative dung. A rare exception to this rule was Edmund Winslow, who eventually mellowed after the death of his brother Richard, and in a classic with the love of a good woman scenario, actually became a full-fledged babyface in the pro-wrestling lexicon when he romanced Richard's widow Cassie. But then he slowly turned heel again, driven mad by the appearance of Richard's doppelganger, New Springfield DA and former Fed Jeffrey O'Neill. The writing for Jeffrey, sadly, was far more on the paltry level than almost every other character received. Actor Bradley Cole was brought back when the creative team had second thoughts about writing Richard so definitively off of the show, so Jeffrey was written in as a no-nonsense lawman with no explanation for several years about why he looked exactly like Richard. The explanation, when it came, was fairly ho-hum. As an intelligence official, he had plastic surgery to make his face look just like Richard's so that he could impersonate him to head off security threats. Of course, Jeffrey's relationship with Cassie imploded under the weight of the revelation that he had impersonated Richard to sleep with her once in San Cristobal. What was that we were saying about highly offensive storylines during this time period? Jeffrey's backstory was fleshed out further when it turned out that, surprise, he and Olivia had a daughter that had been given up for adoption, but was already on canvas in the form of Ava Peralta. Of course, this era being what it was, the writers reached just a little bit more for shock value by portraying the impregnation as not being entirely consensual back then. And as gifted an actor as Bradley Cole is, there was little to no justification for shoving Jeffrey so far to the forefront of the program, given the short shrift that was provided to other more historical characters. At least the Jeffrey-Olivia storyline did a bit to explain how she devolved into the bitter train wreck that she was, previously gravitating from Philip to Bill to Frank and his father Buzz more or less simultaneously, while being portrayed as at least somewhat sympathetic by an oblivious writing team. Among her many sins was tricking Billy Lewis into falling off the wagon at a time when she was involved with his son and wanted to advance his career at the old man's expense. What a piece of work she was. We'll skip over the most maddening of all the character choices for the moment, as we note the vast changes in the presentation of the show from 2003 to 2009. The sets received a radical makeover in 2005, freshening the look while simultaneously doing more to divorce the viewers emotionally from so many characters that they struggled to recognize anymore. And now they were seeing them in settings that didn't resemble the program that they knew. But sadly, we hadn't seen nothing yet. 
In January of 2008, the show moved away from a traditional presentation altogether in favor of a radically low-budget makeover with handheld cameras that suggested the guerrilla filmmaker movie genre. Sets were now a quaint notion of the past, as the show filmed a great many scenes outdoors in locales that frankly looked nothing like the Springfield that we had seen for decades. And the crappy, schlocky folk music that played over what seemed like every single scene made you want to shove a skewer through your eardrums. With production values beneath those of cable access television, the hemorrhaging viewership numbers continued to plunge. Okay, back to the character decision that we referenced because it bookended this era and embodied the weirdness and unsatisfying feeling that hung over it like very little else. In 2003, Philip was driven to an asylum by the pressures of his life, which was frankly an understandable creative decision based on how he'd always been written, a good guy who struggled with his spalding side. He came out embittered about how Olivia had taken advantage of the situation, marrying him and getting grabby with his assets, and soon his grudge spread across the town, but especially to the Cooper family. Similar to Roger's rampage of 1993, which was set out much more logically, the inevitable countdown to Philip getting shot transpired through the fall of 2004, and yet, although he was pronounced dead, the program flinched from keeping him dead, revealing within months that his life had been saved, and he had been whisked away to try to regain his sanity outside of Springfield. Worse yet, Guiding Light, while not wishing to pay Grant Alexander's salary, did what these programs never do, and for very good reason. The character was kept on the canvas in a form that we'll call Absent Philip. The occasional set of footsteps would be shown, implying that Philip was lurking around, but usually he would be mentioned in the form of characters such as Rick or Alan, mentioning that they had just interacted with him. Absent Philip was an atrocious storyline device that was frankly used to justify whatever stories that the writers wanted to tell anyway, such as killing off Ross for budget reasons when he suffered an accident pursuing the truth about Philip. The end of Absent Philip, along with the -the off-the-rails era itself, came when he returned to attend the Valentine's Day wedding of his beloved Beth to his father Alan in 2009. Sadly, what many sensed at the time was also true. It was the beginning of the end of the program itself. Next time, we'll examine how the show rallied for the best conclusion possible under the circumstances. Thank you for tuning in to this mini-episode of the FDH Lounge. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN. And Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Paper Mate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and The Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 